I would like to ask you now, who's sitting right next to me from PIT, that stands for Product Innovation Team in uh, Silicon Valley, you're based, uh, to talk about you know, how they came up with the idea for this uh, new product. Yoon. Thank you, Professor Schmidt. Hello, everyone. Good morning. My name is Yoon. I have a three hour jet lag from the West Coast, which is more devastating than 15 hours going to Korea. <laughs> so I may be mumbling a little bit. Um, when people ask me, um, how do you come up with this kind of idea, you know, they somehow think that there's a group of genius sitting in Silicon Valley thinking about problems like this, and, you know, light bulb, suddenly a light bulb comes up, and, you know, voila, here's an idea, you know, go <clears throat> sell it. Uh, I wish it was like that, um, because then I would be making a lot more ideas. But it, the truth of the matter is, it's a very, very rigorous process and a very, very rigorous discipline. So I'd like to you know, start with that. And um, one of the things um, that we, we uh, PIT was formed not so long ago, about three years, three and a half years ago within Samsung. And the primary mission, the primary mission was to change our product, consumer facing product development process from engineering driven to consumer driven. That was it, very simple. Some of the other product categories that we make, like you know, flash memory cards and LCD panels, it, it is you know, predominantly engineering driven. But for consumer facing products that provides experience to the consumers, we wanted to make it consumer driven. So today, in about the next, I don't know, five, 10 minutes, I'd like to talk about four things. Um, I'd, I'd like to keep my uh, speech very simple. There are four major things that we focus on in our lab uh, to come up with consumer-driven product. Uh, the first and foremost um, is the process itself. Now, when you think about process, um, it's kind of counterintuitive. You know, if you have process, you're confining stuff, and you know your cre creativity goes out. However, if you work for a company that employs 150,000 people and that produces 15,000 SKUs a year. Um, you know, whether we like it or not, that's the, the, the strategy that Samsung is taking, unlike Apple. Without a replicable process, it is very difficult to make innovation stick within an organization, within a large organization. But there is a, uh, there is a secret sauce to it. Uh, we make the process extremely simple. Process makes it replicable, but sometimes process, process can bog you down. So we made the process extremely simple. It's almost like a stage gate, not exactly a stage gate, but we provide a stage for people to think about, okay, you know, what am I doing in this stage? And then people go out and do things on their own, come back and you know, value, you know, evaluate against a, you know, against a certain criteria we have. That process within Samsung is actually called, very simple, New Concept Development, NCD. Uh, it, it comprises of uh, four stages. Understand, ideate, concept development, and concept, finaliz concept finalization. It's very easy, yet, you know, believe it or not, Samsung's been around for 40 years, we've never done it. Understand the consumer, get the insight, ideate your concept, get the concept, develop your concept using criterias and finalize for commercialization, very simple. The second one is about the data. Um, when you have process, what often happens is that you get caught up in the process and you know, once you check off, okay, I did the process, now what? You're completely forgetting about the data. So data and analyzing the data is very, very important. So to give you an example for a dual, dual view, um, it was something like this. When we went out and researched, 67% of the people taking photos under 45, I'm sorry, under 45, was taking themselves, not others. I mean, that was just, that was so whoppingly lopsided in you know, what the data was suggesting. Yet there was no camera in the market that fully supported that action, you know, so. It was, an, it was a rather easy decision. 
And the second thing in, 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 in terms of data is you have, to, you have to know what business you're in. So if you're in a camera business, first and foremost, it needs to take a good picture. Now, um, when we went into focus groups, um, the response that we were getting was like, does Samsung make cameras? I never knew. 90% of the time we got that response. And you know, we were rather discouraged. But that gave us another reasons to you know, dive into another set of data, which was we unbranded everything, Canon, Nikon, you know, Sony, Samsung, and we gave it to the consumers, and we let them judge the picture quality. And the data came back completely random, completely random, which suggests that our picture quality is right up there with all the rest of them. So that triggered us to focus our direction from competing megapixels and you know, s slimness and memory size to how can we support the lifestyle of younger consumers. And that's how we led to uh, focus on that, that idea. The third one that we focus on is consumer value proposition communication. And it has to be extremely simple. We have three strikeout rule uh, within, within my lab. And what that means is that if you have an extremely well-positioned value proposition, that's a home run. If you have two value propositions, that's OK. If you have three value propositions in your product, it becomes a failure. It's too complicated. People tend to retain only one or two information, not three. You know, three, three is a strikeout. So for us, from the market data, there were several very, very interesting nuggets that we wanted to drive. One was obviously self-shooting. The second one was connectivity. Everybody wanted Wi-Fi and connected environment, you know, et cetera. And then there are a few others. We decided to actually split those two and make it into concepts each because we believe the communication was too strong. Both, both uh, value propositions were too strong to, uh, to put it in one body. Another interesting thing is, um, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's voice of the customers, but there's also um, voice of the experts. Um, now, in, in, in a certain world, you can't only focus on one area or the other because there's a spillover influence. So that, that's one of the things that we wanted to balance. And the third one was something like Wi-Fi was such an advanced concept that it might not give the right experience. This one was so simple to execute. Wi-Fi in concept is a very good value proposition, but it was very difficult to execute. The last one, before I hand over to uh, Reed, is, uh, is, is what I call balancing. And this is an interesting thing, and it's a little bit controversial. I want to make it short, but it's a little controversial. I think you, most of you heard about design thinking and design management. Um, I hope you do. Um, there's a book written about and all of that. If you really read, uh, if you read through design management, it talks about the process not, not so much different from engineering process or scientific discovery. In our, in our uh, lab, there is a very distinct de definition of what design management is. In our lab, the definition of design management is balancing functional and emotional values to, uh, to a product. So, Imagine, imagine that you wanted to hold a water in a jug and you went through a design management process, traditional design management process, and only created um, a very functional object. Then a very beautiful crystal bob, you know, jug, you can't come up with it because if you drop, it breaks. There's all the emotional elements of crystal vase that makes it so wonderful that people will compromise a bit of a functional value to embrace. Now, for some reason, technology-driven companies, they do drop tests, they do water immersion tests, they do all the functional tests, but in their quality division, there's no emotional quality testing. So we, we, make, we made sure that our product was both functional and ima you know, emotional. Imagine, imagine the front LCD turned on all the time. And, and look how ugly it could be, you know. I mean, it, it's like someone who's dead with their eyes open, you know. It's like, I'm looking at you all the time. The, so what we did was, you know, we, with a simple technical click, um, it, you know, the, uh, the front LCD turns off. So when you look at the camera, it looks like just, it, it just looks like, it looks like any other um, average normal-looking camera. 
but if you tap the front, the LCD will turn on. So we wanted to make sure we balanced that functional side and that emotional side, and that's how we came up <coughs> with, it, with the concept. Hi, this is a question for Yun. Um, you talked about the need for balance and the balance between the functional and emotional, and you specifically talked about both functional and emotional quality testing. And my question is, how do you actually do that testing for the emotional component? Uh, very good question, and there's no straight answers to that because feel good really is, uh, uh, is feel good. There's no rationality be, you know, behind emotionally feeling good. So we do a lot of qualitative testings, asking people around. Um, we try to stay away with uh, quantitative testings on the emotional side. Um, what we do is we use quantitative numbers to put our argument through. The important thing about emotional testing is first you have to believe it and second you have to actually have an ability to put a linear story around why this is emotionally appealing. And that usually comes um, from an, I hate to admit, but from an individual capabilities to uh, yeah, put an argument through. So qualitative testing is mostly what we do. Thank you.